Can I ask senators to take their seats or leave the chamber? I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 12 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Wong. Pursuant to Dear, dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The failure of the Prime Minister to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and safe national quarantine, meaning that 10 million Australians begin the week yet again languishing in lockdown. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Is that right? Um, thank you. And I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, today in the chamber about the Morrison government's failure to deliver the effective vaccine rollout and failure to deliver safe national quarantine, meaning that we do have millions of Australians, 10 million Australians, who are currently living under lockdown situations. And I think it's worth having uh, to go back and having a look at what happened right from the beginning of the vaccine rollout to answer the question, why has it been such a shambles and why has there been so much confusion around the public messaging and why has every target or commitment given by this government failed to be achieved or reached? And it starts right back at the beginning of the announcements around the vaccine uh, procurement strategy. when At the beginning of November, the Prime Minister told all of Australia that Australia is at the front of the queue. That is where this, uh, the, the misinformation and the commitments given but never reached started. This was the day that the Prime Minister announced a deal for 10 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 40 million from Novavax, saying that Australia was at the front of the queue for the mRNA vaccines. Of course, as now one of the issues with our low vaccination rates is the failure to have adequate supply of the uh, Pfizer vaccine, we know that being front of the queue was simply not true. The Prime Minister also said, we aren't putting all our eggs in one basket and we will continue to pursue further vaccines should our medical experts recommend them. And again, either the experts failed to provide the government with the advice that was actually needed by this country, or the Prime Minister chose to have a very reduced number of deals. When you look around other countries, they were, uh, they were signing up to six or seven, five, six or seven deals. The Australian government made an absolutely clear decision not to do that. The, the Prime Minister then committed to having four million Australians vaccinated by the end of March. He made this commitment in January 2021. Of course, we all know now this was never reached either. On the 31st of January, the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, says Australia will be fully vac vaccinated by October. He states that we aim to have the country 20 million adults vaccinated before the end of October. We now know, of course, that that won't happen either. On the 1st of February 2021, the Prime Minister made another promise that all Australians who want a vaccine will be vaccinated by October. But just a few days later, the failure to deliver on, on commitments started. On the 5th of February, the Health Secretary, Professor Murphy, said that it's more realistic that Australia will hit the 4 million um, vaccinated by early April rather than mid-March. So this was just a matter of a few weeks after the Prime Minister had given that commitment they were accepting that they weren't going to meet it. On the 15th of February, the Prime Minister sets a new target of 60,000 doses for February instead of the 80,000 he promised in January. On the 16th of February, 
The Health Minister announced that the aged care vaccination rollout will take approximately six weeks. Remember that? Still not done. Still not done. That was on the 16th of February. And here we are in August, and we know there's still aged care residents to be vaccinated with their second dose, and we know that the aged care workforce, the ones that are actually bringing the virus into aged care residential settings, uh, has, haven't been vaccinated. And we learnt just a couple of weeks ago that the home care workforce, nobody actually knows what's happening to them because there isn't a plan, because a decision was taken to not really pursue the home care workforce because they were too wound up with how they were failing to meet the residential aged care vaccination targets. On the 28th of February this year, the government's target of 60,000 doses by the end of February we'd find out that only about half of those had been administered. So right from the get-go, every target set by this government has failed. And then on the 11th of March, just a month after the Prime Minister says everyone will be vaccinated, everyone who wants to be vaccinated will be fully vaccinated by October, Professor Murphy says again, he bells the cat, yet, well, we don't know whether we'll be able to achieve two shots by the end of October. On the 31st of March, the day that we were meant to hit the target of four million vaccinations by the end of March, the Prime Minister fails to meet the target he set himself by 3.4 million vaccinations. So where he promised four million, he delivered 600,000. A week later, what a surprise, there's a rollout recalibration. And, he, and the Prime Minister announces that after Atagi advice, Pfizer will now be the preferred vaccine for under 50s. And what a surprise, there isn't enough. This is where the shortage of supply, because we failed to secure a deal with Pfizer that allowed for these, this sort of redundancy. On the 11th of April, the commitment to have all of aged care residents and workers and disability care residents fully vaccinated by Easter, that failed, that went. And somehow, a few months later, we find out that their decision had been taken to take disability residents out of that because they were prioritising aged care residents, which they didn't meet. And nobody told people working in the disability sector or people living with a disability themselves that that decision had been taken. On the 12th of April, the Prime Minister releases a video statement where he announces that Australia no longer has vaccination targets. What a surprise, considering that, that the targets the government had set themselves had been missed and had failed. We got promised 13 pop-up vaccine clinics to get aged care done and disability care services that would be opened by the end of May in New South Wales, but by July just three were listed on the Department of Health website. In May, the May ta vaccination target of 6 million vaccinated by May was failed. Then the next day, the 11th of May, the Treasurer states in his budget speech that every Australian who'd like to get two shots of that vaccine will be able to do so by the end of the year. Well, we know that didn't last a day before the Prime Minister overruled the Treasurer and made it clear that it's actually not government policy any longer to have a commitment that Australians will have access to two doses by the end of the year. Now the target's moved to, well, we'll just hope that you'll have one dose or you'll be offered a vaccine by October. The Prime Minister says these aren't our assumptions any longer. They are not the policy settings. On the 28th of May, Australia reaches 3.9 million vaccinations, two months behind the original schedule, which predicted four million doses by the end of March. The 13 pop-up clinics that were promised. Right, still, at the end of May, only three of them. In aged care, in June, the aged care minister acknowledges that he doesn't know how many people in the aged care workforce have been vaccinated, and health officials say only 10 per cent of the workforce has been reached through in-house vaccination programs, and at least 20 aged care facilities are to be visited as part of the aged care residents' vaccination rollout. This is in June. The vaccination rollout started in February, and aged care residents, disability residents, workers in those areas 
They were 1A. They were meant to be done in the first six weeks. On the 19th of June, we got a new term, horizons. That was to replace the word targets, we think. We haven't had an ad campaign. We've had um, strategies. We've had um, plans. We've had horizons. We've had targets. And now we've got a campaign plan being launched. It seems every time something goes wrong with the vaccine rollout, another document comes out, more phases, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, that's now phases A, B and C. And now we have the, mo the Doherty modelling announcing different arrangements that are being put in place. Is it any wonder people are confused about what's going on? There hasn't been an ad campaign to target people around the vaccination because we haven't had enough supply, because we didn't have enough deals, because decisions taken last year have turned out to, be, to fail the Australian people in terms of getting an efficient rollout, to getting it done properly and to making sure we're protecting vulnerable people. None of that, which should have guided the strategy, has actually been achieved today, some six months after the rollout started. Senator Davey. Thank you, um, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. Ah, look, you know, uh, it's all well and good to be very negative in uh, what is uh, a negative in a very trying and difficult time. It's all well and good to, with hindsight, say that we should have had multiple vac vaccine deals with multiple vaccine companies who have not even put in an application to have their vaccinations approved for use in Australia yet. Um, it's all well and good to, to say that the Prime Minister has failed, but that is a very, very harsh judgment. Our government under the Prime Minister have spent the last 561 days working day and night with the health experts, listening to the health ex um, advice to try and deal with this pandemic. We were one of the first nations in the world to actually notify that the virus was, um, was a human pandemic potential. That was in January 2020, at the same time as we were dealing with devastating bushfires and trying very hard to keep our country and our morale up at that time. We were already listening to the health experts. We were already watching this pandemic, and we have continued to be working with the health experts ever since. We have worked hard, and our efforts, which initially had the full support of the Labor Party, um, are estimated to have saved over 30,000 lives. We've supported over 3 million Australians through JobKeeper while keeping Australia's economy on track with over one million Australians getting back to work. We have invested more than $370 million, now that is $659,000 per day since the pandemic began, in support for COVID-19 research and development. As at the start of August, we've now got 5,000 GPs practicing, uh, practices playing a crucial role in administering the COVID vaccine rollout. And while, yes, I accept Senator Gallagher's um, accurate reflection that we missed a target, we didn't have 4 million people vaccinated by April. That is right. The Prime Minister has acknowledged this, and he has publicly apologised for um, missing the mark. But we have turned that round. We had met the four million mark by mid-June. We are now vaccinating a million people a day. And just in the last 28 days, um, we have administered over four million doses. So we're now doing four million doses a month, which has really turned it, turned it round. We've also got our pharmacies, our community pharmacies on board to start delivering or to deliver vaccinations. And I also want to acknowledge the work of the Royal Flying Doctor Service, who have been out and about in our most regional and remote communities and have administered 9,200 vaccine do doses across 88 remote communities, including 
uh, remote Indigenous communities. I also want to mention the important work our government is doing to support other countries, countries in the South Pacific, who are being crucified by this pandemic. We have sent over 153.6 million doses. Sorry, over 153 million doses have been distributed around the world to 137 countries, and we have helped our neighbours and friends in Papua New Guinea, Timor Leste, Fiji, and the Solomon Islands get their hands on crucial doses to help their populations. Because we don't turn our back on our neighbour. This pandemic is immeasurable. But this motion goes to show how out of touch Labor is with the everyday Australian. There is so much health advice that is coming out uh, from those opposite that doesn't necessarily reflect the advice that the experts are giving us. Australians know that our government is behind them. We are working our hardest to ensure that we get through COVID and that our economy is in a position to be able to recover and respond. Thank you. Senator Seward. We can't hear Senator Seward. Do you want to log out and log back in? We can see you, Senator Seward, but we can't hear you. Do we have any advice from Hansard as to what she needs to do? Senator Seward, you need to log out and log back in. And we we will go proceed to Jenny, uh, Senator McAllister, if she is online. I am um, Senator McAllister. Uh, Madam Acting, Dep Acting Deputy President, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. That's terrific. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, millions of Australians across the country are now in a COVID-19 lockdown because the Prime Minister has bundled the two jobs that were most important this year, rolling out the vaccine and fixing the nation's quarantine system. Let's be very clear about what is happening. Lockdowns are still happening because the Prime Minister didn't treat the rollout as a race. It was always a race. Uh, the rollout remains the most important job the government has, and they need to use every option that they have to speed it up because it is not going well. In the rollout race, Australia is coming 84th, 84th in the world. And as Malcolm Turnbull recently pointed out, and I quote him, it is a colossal failure. He went on to say, and I'll quote him again, it is the biggest failure of public administration that he can recall. And it costs a lot, estimated around $300 million a day. The economy is bleeding hundreds of millions of dollars a day and billions each week because Mr Morrison has not done his job. And it's a price being paid by Australian workers and by Australian small businesses or his incompetence. Now, I remember really well how difficult things were at the beginning of the pandemic for Chinese Australian businesses, particularly the restaurants. And at that time, I spoke with Chinese Australian representatives uh, in Burwood, down in Hurstville, about the challenges that they were facing at a time of real uncertainty and fear, but also of rising racism, let's be honest. So, have kept a track on how these communities and these businesses are going. And there was a story the other day about the restaurateur Vivian Chen, uh, who runs Yang's Dumpling Restaurant in Burwood. And she talked in the story about just how devastating it is to be back in lockdown in 2021. She pulled her business through the challenges in 2020, 
but this time it's really tough. And she said this, and I'll quote it. She said, this lockdown is proving very, very hard for us. Our business is more than 75% down compared to this time last year. And it's really bad now. There are virtually no customers. Yesterday I made $200, which isn't even enough to cover my employee costs. I really want to keep my staff because if they go, I won't have staff anymore when this lockdown is finished. She said that many of her friends had already closed their businesses, struggled during the previous lockdown, and this one is proving to be the last straw. She said they couldn't manage with the opening and the closing, opening and closing, so they've given up and closed permanently. It's these small businesses and the workers that they employ that are bearing the brunt of these lockdowns, and we owe it to them to fix it, to fix up the, the rollout and fix up the quarantine. Of course, it's possible to quantify the impact, the economic impact with a number. But we don't live in an economy, we live in a society. And although it's more difficult to quantify the impact on the lockdown, on the bonds between us, it doesn't make that impact any less real. And in Sydney, it seems likely that children will go for months without having a lesson in a classroom or being able to play with their friends. People won't be able to meet their newborn nieces and nephews and older Australians are increasingly isolated without contact with their loved ones. And we've lost the ability to do simple things like have a conversation with our neighbours. Our communities really are the sum of these genuine, sometimes casual or human interactions. And technologies like Zoom and Skype really don't substitute for them. None of this is an argument against lockdowns. Public health officials are rightly telling us that short and sharp lockdowns are amongst the best tools that we have right now to avoid a devastating spread of the Delta variant. But all of this is an argument for having fought tooth and nail previously, back when we had the space and the time to put in place the conditions that would have allowed us to avoid this. Every dollar that the Prime Minister saved by not ordering more and diverse range of vaccines back in 2020 is looking very expensive indeed. And every excuse that he provided for his refusal to establish a national quarantine facility looks very foolish indeed. Now, has there been any real reckoning with any of this? any sincere examination of performance. Not really. There's a continuing insistence that everything is going actually quite well. There's been little regret, much less sincere apology. Indeed, there's been deflection, blame shifting, the point where it's surely getting a little embarrassing for the Prime Minister's own team, because it's always someone else's fault. Headline after headline, press conference after press conference, it's not his fault. It's a targi, it's the Italians, it's the aged care workers who didn't get you know, themselves organised. It's somebody else's fault, but it's never his. And this week in a new low, the coalition is bizarrely trying to assert that it's the opposition's fault. Now, this is fanciful, and just a little desperate, right? Labor has always supported the health advice, 100%. We support it about lockdowns. We support it about Pfizer. We support it about AstraZeneca. And any suggestion to the contrary is total nonsense. And unlike the Prime Minister, we have never sought to undermine the health advice, never attacked a targi, never sought to influence a their advice through waging some sort of public campaign. My letter, Mr Albanese and our entire federal lab team have supported the science and supported the evidence around the pandemic. And that is a position that really can be distinguished from the behaviour of the Prime Minister and the people around him, especially, especially that group of backbenchers who have sought to gain political advantage by micro-targeting messages to the anti-lockdown crowd and the anti-vaccine crowd. This is 
Oddly enough, a government that seems determined to behave like an opposition. It really is quite strange. They would rather point the finger, complain about external circumstances and actually take responsibility for delivering and for leading. Because what you need, what we need right now as a community is actually leadership. We need real leaders willing to step up and accept the heavy burden of leadership at a really difficult time. We need leaders to take decisions in the national interest. Australia is facing the biggest health crisis in a century. And if Scott Morrison, Mr Morrison and his team do not want the job of governing under those circumstances, they really should get out of the way. Labor does have a plan to beat COVID-19 to support our community through this pandemic. And it starts with treating the rollout like a race. We would bring the necessary urgency to this task if we were governing. We'd work to increase supply by talking closely with the vaccine companies, with our allies. We would vaccinate frontline workers by bringing the vaccine to them, rather than putting the burden on them to organise their own arrangements. We wouldn't blame them, certainly, like the Morrison government has. And we build the capability to start manufacturing vaccines here. We recognise what is required to lead. And we recognise the imperative for leadership at this time. The Morrison government's failures have left millions of people in very, very difficult circumstances. And it is time that instead of deflecting blame and saying that it is someone else's fault, that they stood up and took responsibility for leading at this most difficult time. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seward? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, great. Please proceed. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, the Greens are supporting this MPI about the failure of the Prime Minister to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and safe national quarantine meaning that 10 million Australians begin the week yet again in lockdown, languishing in lockdown. When it comes to getting out of COVID, the government had a number of key tasks. Vaccines and quarantine were key. Yet the Morrison government failed to secure enough vaccine or enough diversity of vaccines. They failed to provide clear messaging and advice and they failed to provide us with an evidence-based pathway out of this mess. I welcome the release of the modelling from the Doherty Institute that was used to inform the government's national plan to reopen Australia. But this only prompts more questions. For example, why weren't the Doherty Institute asked to model the impact of reopening our borders? Under phase C of the government's plan, caps on returned Australians would be abolished and international travel restrictions would be lifted. So many Australians have felt the heartbreak um, impact of border closures. For many people, life is on hold until our borders are open once more. Everyone knows, deserves to know when the government is planning on reopening borders and the associated risks involved. It's a huge shortcoming and I'm disappointed the government hasn't asked um, for this information. So many Australians are hanging out to see relatives and their loved ones. And so many Australians are hanging out to come home. The Doherty Institute also looked at what would happen if we had partial or optimal effectiveness of testing, tracing, isolation and quarantine. We do not have optimal contact tracing and quarantine arrangements in Australia. This is abundantly clear from the 27 breaches of hotel quarantine, which have sent us into so many lockdowns. So if our contact tracing and quarantine is only partially effective, the Doherty Institute predicts we will still continue to need lockdowns for 18 to 22% of the time once 70% of the population is vaccinated. The government is gambling with our future by refusing to include children in its vaccination target. Again, the Doherty Institute thinks that vaccinating children would only achieve modest reduction in transmission. Yet we know that children aged 0 to 19 account for more COVID cases in Australia than people aged 70 and over. Children can catch and transmit COVID, evident through the outbreaks in Queensland at the moment. 
Children can also catch COVID from their vaccinated parents. This is another reason why we need to understand exactly what the government asked the Doherty Institute to model. That is very unclear. While the government is asking, um, is making critical decisions about our way out of COVID, private consulting companies are continuing to make huge profits. Um, and, and yet we still have significant uh, troubles and mistakes made through the vaccine rollout. We have no idea about the qualities of the strategic planning they're supposed to have given, the advice and case studies they're supposed to have given, or whether they are even used in decision making. These are all confidential uh, reports. I'd just like to say on a personal note uh, and encourage people to get vaccinated. My mother and I have now had our second dose. We got vaccinated together, both being in 1B. Please, I urge Australians to get vaccinated. We need the government to come clean about what are their targets and when we will be able to open Senator our borders. Seward, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I've made a habit now of uh, thanking the opposition for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, on matters of public importance that they bring before this chamber, and uh, now is no different. Because when they're writing them, they must think that the wording is clever, they, that they'll get a few runs on the board today, and that somehow they'll embarrass the government. Uh, but in reality, what they actually do is expose themselves. They give us the opportunity time after time to come in here and talk about their lack of policy and how they've managed to go through this whole pandemic without making a sing single meaningful contribution to the public debate. And they've come up here with these really clever campaign slogans about how we have two jobs, uh, much the same uh, with how this MPI is worded here today. Uh, they've put a lot of time into developing that little campaign. Uh, just think, uh, writing all those talking points, getting them out to all the MPs, putting them on social media so that they can trot them out to anyone who will listen. They've taken months of preparation, months of saying the same thing over and over again, trying to get into people's minds. And This week they've managed to unwind it all. One policy announcement and all of that effort, all of that effort was wasted. The Leader of the Opposition fronted the media and came out with his grand plan to get Australians vaccinated. Give them cash, he said, $300 to anyone, everyone who gets the jab. Firstly, it's a massive insult to Australians, to the intelligence of Australians. And that's the whole debate. That, and that's a whole debate to have in and of itself. But most significantly, by making this announcement, Labor have finally come to the party and backed our vaccine plan. They have finally admitted that we actually are in a position to get between 70 to 80 per cent of Australians vaccinated by Christmas. Otherwise, they wouldn't be out there saying that we should be giving them $300. Because they have confirmed what we already know on this side is that we have the supply of vaccines for every Australian who want one to have one by Christmas. And just like that, they've undermined months, months of their own scare campaigns. So why the $300? Because it's true there are many in our community that do have some reluctance. There's a lot of misinformation flying about, uh, about the vaccine strategy, and I must say that those opposite are actually doing little to deal with it. Because just like what they did with JobKeeper, they had to fight it every single step of the way. They had to try and undermine it, and when it wound down, uh, it was, they were saying that it was going to cause mass unemployment. They said the economic apocalypse would come. They claimed that it would come, but it never came. In fact, quite the opposite. The lowest unemployment rate in 10 years. Did we hear any retraction? Did we hear any admission that their predictions did not come true? Sadly, no. I wonder if I can be surprised by those opposite when we get to Christmas and we've achieved those targets set out by the Prime Minister that I know that Australians will step up to. <coughs> will those opposite acknowledge that their gloomy predictions were wrong? 
Will they bring themselves here to the Senate for an hour like we are with this MPI and acknowledge that you got it wrong and celebrate Australia's success? Or will they yet again bring to the Senate some other, some other political point score? Because just like they've, they have with every policy response uh, that we've put in this place, uh, that we've put in place to deal with the economic and health consequences of this pandemic, they either go too far, they don't go far enough, they say, it's too big or too small, or you name it, because they've brought up every single argument they can to undermine it. Yet here we are, having been able to deal with the response of the pandemic like no other nation in the world. You wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And this vaccine rollout will be no different. Already, more than 12.5 million doses have been administered, and we're now hitting well over 1 million doses every week, over 200,000 a weekday. Day. A total of 4.5 million vaccinations were given in July, which is more than double, double the amount achieved in May when 2.1 million doses were administered. Sure, there have been issues. There have been issues of supply. We've resolved those issues. The Prime Minister, working with his leadership, have dealt with those problems. And uh, not all the calls that we've made have gone out as we had hoped, but we've turned the corner. What they fail to understand is that every time a new campaign, campaign hits the airwaves, particularly in relation to the vaccine rollout, where we have hesitancy in the community, more and more people second-guess the efficacy of the program. They're doing nothing to underscore the efficacy of the program. They're undermining it every step of the way. They're turning what should be a medical conversation to a political one. That should never be the case. And we're seeing it here with the substance of this MPI. And it's absolutely despicable. There have been setbacks. Of course there have. Never before has a nation had to deal with a, max, with a rollout in the scale that we're dealing with right now. But this is what Australian families are dealing with. But unlike those opposite, we're capable of wearing those setbacks. We're capable of owning them, correcting them and, importantly, moving on. The Prime Minister has done that. And we're on the home stretch. The next six months will be the defining moment, the definitive moment in our response. Every nation is racing to get people vaccinated. The world is opening up again. They won't be waiting for Australia, but we'll be ready for when that happens. We'll be ready because we're on track and we have an achievable time frame with the rate of vaccines that are occurring right now with the pipeline of vaccines available, with the health staff that we have, fantastic health staff, GPs, pharmacists and infrastructure in place to get the job done. We know that we can do it. We know that Australians will step up. We know that Australians are stepping up to roll up their sleeves and are having that jab. This is a massive, massive national effort, unlike anything we've ever seen. Now, that's a phrase that uh, you hear often. You hear it often, but it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It requires everyone to get on board, to either have the vaccine, either have the vaccine or be having conversations in the community with those that have concerns. And that's why I would say it's a great national effort. Labor just needs to join the team. Labor just needs to get in behind Australia, not seek to undermine it for some sort of political score, some sort of political point. Now I know many of the senators on that side of the chamber. They're good people. They're good people. And I know that they're better than these cheap campaigns. There's a few, Senator Farrell. This isn't time for cheap political points. We're coming up to an election soon, and there'll be plenty of time for that during the election campaign. Between now and Christmas, this is about getting behind Australia, supporting those that need to go and get the vaccine, and supporting those that have got some hesitancy. We understand that. Now's the time to join us. Now's the time to join with Australians as they make the decision to come forward and get vaccinated. Every day that you're trying to make vaccines political, you're making those last few percentage points of people getting the vaccine that little bit harder to reach. Now, I expect you to disagree with what I've just said. I expect you to disagree with what I've just said, but you've got to step up. In Victoria, 
Some of the statements of the Labor candidate for Higgins is something that no doubt ought to disappoint every single person in this room, undermining the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine. I won't, I won't even uh, repeat the things that have been said because I don't want to give them any credence at all. Now, I'm not a doctor. That's a full disclaimer. But I have as much information available to me as anyone else in this place, and I can say that those statements that have been said are not grounded in fact, yet we have candidates for the Labor Party out there sprouting this stuff. But those are the sorts of views that we're hearing from your side of politics, views put to the Australians that are deciding whether to come forward for a vaccine. The path for Australia is clear. Life after lockdowns, no restrictions, opening up the rest of the world again to the rest of the world again, uh, and seeing Australians getting vaccinated. This is what we need to do. You should be dedicating yourselves to encourage people to do so, to get out and get vaccinated, rather than scoring cheap political points. You're better than that. You're better than that. Let's work together. Let's work together before Christmas so that we have even more reason to celebrate at Christmas than what we already have. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This matter of public importance raises five important questions. Can everyday Australians, while locked up under house arrest in Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales or Victoria, tell the difference between the Liberal Party response and the Labor Party response to COVID? I can't. Can truck drivers and workers who need to cross a border for their livelihood tell the difference between Labor's border closures and Liberal National's border closures? I can't. Can grieving Australians needing to travel to see a sick loved one or attend a funeral tell the difference between Labor states' callous restrictions and Liberal national states' callous restrictions? I can't. Are Labor premiers standing up for small and medium businesses? No, they're not. Liberal and Labor premiers are wreaking equal destruction of businesses, marriages and lives. On Senator O'Neill's question regarding the vaccination program, can everyday Australians who believe in my body, my choice, tell the difference between the threats, intimidation and coercion that Liberal Scott Morrison, Gladys Berejiklian and Stephen Marshall use, and the threats, intimidation and coercion that Labor's Dan Andrews, Mark McGowan and Anastasia Palaszczuk use. I can't. Has the Prime Minister, has one state premier, Liberal or Labor, stood up for the, every, for the rights of everyday Australians to manage COVID, not hide from it? No, they have not. Have you even asked Australians what the people want? No, you have not. Millions of Australians are currently under house arrest as a result of a COVID protocol that the Liberal National and Labor parties, acting in concert as one party, enthusiastically imposed on Australians. It's a protocol that says a sick person is sick until proven healthy, yet sick until proven healthy is the same as guilty until proven innocent. Both represent a totalitarian mindset, a mindset to control that would have been soundly rejected at any other point in our history and should be rejected now. There's no difference between the Labor and Liberal National Party when it comes to COVID response. None. As in so many areas, Labor unites with the Liberal Nationals. Senator Ruckett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This motion captures the deep frustration and pain of the Australian people regarding the failure of the Prime Minister Morrison to deliver a speedy, effective rollout of COVID-19 vaccines and a safe national quarantine, meaning that 10 million Australians yet again are languishing in lockdown. In the last 24 hours, we've heard some outrageous statements by those opposite, somehow trying to link Labor senators' concerns about this government's abject failure in these areas to the Olympic Games. Yesterday, we heard Senator Hughes attempt to describe Labor as unpatriotic and unsupportive of Team Australia because we demand on behalf of the Australian people an efficient vaccine rollout that allows Australians to get on with their lives, to be safe and out of lockdown. We could describe Senator Hughes's awkward attempts to draw this connection as a double backflip with a sideways deflection. In fact, she flipped so many times we were concerned that she may stumble and lose her balance entirely. And today we heard Senator Chandler perform a magnificent long jump, long jump as, a, um, and as she sincerely explained that we must learn to be flexible and adapt. What a magnificent leap that was. 
And what an insult to the millions of Australians who have juggled homeschooling with working from home, the businesses that have built online stores, the cafes and restaurants that turn to takeaways, the churches, artists and community organisations who have rebuilt their congregations and audiences online, the teachers who switched to online classrooms almost overnight, and health workers who have been so flexible with their working hours that they have not seen their families for days and worked to the point of exhaustion. The majority of Australians have done an amazing and courageous job to pivot and adapt to this pandemic. They do not need or deserve lectures from the Liberal Party senators on this subject. They deserve an efficient and effective vaccine program. They deserve world-class quarantine facilities. And they're tired of this rubbish from a government which has proven itself un utterly unable to show leadership. The Prime Minister is excellent at dodging the facts, gives a gold medal performance at avoiding the apology that he owes the country and is truly gifted at coming last. Because for all Senator Hughes's sidesteps and deflections, we are coming last in the developed world when it comes to the vaccine rollout. And in my part of the world, northwest Tasmania, the data the government released this week shows that we are towards the tail end of the field. In the northwest, just 21.8 per cent of people aged over 15 having been fully vaccinated, 5 per cent behind Launceston and 3.5 per cent behind the capital Hobart. On first jabs, the situation is markedly worse, 9 .5, uh, 9, a full 9 per cent behind Hobart. Many are struggling to access vaccinations. They still can't go to their pharmacy for a COVID jab, and despite workplace pro uh, programs for flu vaccinations, they can't get a COVID vaccine at work. Their local community vaccination hub is closed. In my part of the world, it's going to be open again in mid-August for three weeks to deliver dose two only. We were contacted by a Devonport woman who recently, with her family, has been trying to get vaccinated. The family includes a support worker with many vulnerable clients. Their local vaccination hub had been closed down. They rely on their local chemist for the flu vaccine and assumed that they'd be able to be vaccinated there. But no, that wasn't the case. And meanwhile, Australians hear from overseas that countries like Germany, Hungary and France are so advanced with their vaccine programs that they'll be offering booster shots by September. Booster shops in, shots in Europe when only 21 per cent of people on the northwest coast have had two jabs. It is a race and we are coming last. In fact, we've been lapped. Despite its backflips and twists, Australians know how badly the Morrison government has botched hotel quarantine and vaccinations. And I'm sure that the government senators will continue channelling their inner Olympians and desperately twisting their language for the remainder of this sitting fortnight. We need to be talking about a single, simple message to the Australian people, not the mixed messages and blaming that we're hearing from the Morrison government. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and embracing uh, the sporting analogies that suit the moment uh, with the Tokyo Olympics underway. We've heard lots about long junks and leaps, but we haven't heard anything about policy belly flops. But Australians following this at home have clearly seen one this week with the Labor Party's latest cheap political stunt that ultimately uh, highlights the fact that they have nothing positive to say about the president and are embarrassingly silent on a plan for Australia's recovery. Every single person on the government benches in this place has been honest, from the Prime Minister down, that our response to the pandemic hasn't been perfect. It has had wrinkles and speed bumps, but that's what I guess dealing with a global pandemic, a once-in-a-century global pandemic is, when you are in fact trying to run a country. We have, however, in the face of the biggest health crisis since uh, the Spanish flu pandemic and the biggest economic calamity, arguably since the Great Depression, shown great resilience and adaptability. And we have turned a corner with a plan to return Australia to a post-COVID normal. 
The PM himself has taken responsibility for the early setbacks in that vaccination program. And let's not forget that the Italians are prohibiting the release of 3.8 million doses of AstraZeneca in February was a significant setback completely outside the control of this government. But it was, in fact, the decision of the Morrison government in August last year to ensure that we had a sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability in this country that enabled us to overcome that. Our progress to date isn't the disaster that Labor would represent. There was no plan at any time that had Australia fully vaccinated by today. So those opposite tend to forget that even at the beginning of the pandemic, the Morrison government acted quickly and decisively on key decisions to protect lives and livelihoods. Not only those things I just mentioned, but also being the first nation to close its borders to the world, declaring COVID-19 to be a pandemic more than two weeks before the World Health Organisation did so. That early action was effective and it gave us time, and now it's being used against us for cheap political stunts by the Labor Party. They're trying to take away from the, the, the Australian success. It's not the government's success. This is a, a success that is shared by all Australians in protecting lives to this point of the pandemic and upholding their livelihoods through economic security. By undermining that response, those opposite are doing a disservice to the Australian people as much as they are to themselves. Because of those early actions the Morrison government took, Australia, through the appropriate health authorities, put the vaccines through a normal approval process. This wasn't an emergency approval process that had to be rushed as bodies piled up in the streets. And that's the cold, hard reality of the countries that those opposite point to now was winning this race. Australia did not find itself in that very, very difficult situation because of the leadership that this government took in the early phases of the pandemic. We don't hear much from those opposite about that, but the reality is that there are more Australians who are still with us today than would have otherwise been the case without those very important decisions taken by this government. We have acknowledged that the vaccine rollout has had a slow start, and compared to those countries who have had that, that much greater death rate, I guess there is something to compare. But when you understand that our vaccination rate, now at some 1.2 million shots into arms every week and accelerating, we are well on the way to returning to a post-COVID normal. So those opposite can claim that this is a failure of the Prime Minister, that this is a failure of this government. But when you look at the cold, hard facts and cut through the Labor spin, the policy belly flops, this is what you find. 200,000 vaccines daily, 1.2 million vaccines being administered weekly now as supply increases that will continue to rise. Almost 80 per cent of those aged over 70 are protected with a first dose, and over 42 per cent have received a second dose. If we take the over 50s, more than two-thirds are protected with a first dose, and 27 per cent have received a second dose. So more than four in ten Australians aged over 16 are protected with a first dose. Some 20 per cent, or one in five, have already received a second dose. So when those opposite bleat about the slip from an end of October to a, an end of the year slip in the timeline, let's not forget that an eight-week delay, accounting for the imperfect information as well as operating in a once-in-a-century pandemic, arguably is actually a great success on the part of the Australian people to overcome adversity, to thrive on the challenges that this pandemic represents and to look forward to the future with that inherently Australian optimism. The vaccination program continues to exponentially in increase because we're not resting on our laurels. Much as our economic success uh, doesn't stop, this is a government that has recently announced an extra 85 million Pfizer vaccines, the majority of which will be uh, delivered in the next 12 months. That is not a failure, and I think most Australians agree, because they can see that those opposite are fear-mongering and they're playing political games to the detriment 
of all Australians. So, not content with cheap politics, this week they decided to adopt the typical Labor fashion of throwing money at the solution. So, having learnt nothing from cash for clunkers, pink bats, school hawks and checks to dead people last time they sat on the government benches, this time they decided to try and bribe Australians with their own money to do what they are doing in overwhelming numbers every day. That shows that they've learned nothing from their past failures in government. They've learned nothing from eight years on the opposition benches, and they've not only offended those Australians that continue to do the right thing, but they have again demonstrated why they are unfit to sit on the government benches. They're still stuck in that ideological fantasy land where government spending from the magic money tree is the fix-all solution. On the other hand, as I've outlined today, this is a coalition government that has consistently protected lives and livelihoods, acted early, acted decisively, been pragmatic, non-ideological, followed the health advice and delivered excellent outcomes for Australians by keeping their lives protected and keeping their livelihoods intact. We've acknowledged that JobKeeper and JobSeeker um, allowed the Australian economy to survive what would have otherwise been an economic calamity. The lack of realistic solutions and inconsistency from those on the other benches is astounding. My colleague Senator O'Sullivan was very right to point out that there were predictions from those on the Labor side that the end of JobKeeper would cause the economy to fall off a cliff. Instead, we saw unemployment with a four in front of it, more Australians in work than there were at the start of the pandemic, and in fact near record participation rates, particularly for females in the Australian workforce. In one breath, they criticise us for uh, preventing international arrivals and leaving Australians stranded overseas, and then in the other, they're having a go at hotel quarantine, which was a consensus decision taken by the National Cabinet to ensure that the, the maximum number of returning Australians could be accommodated in the context of the health advice. That shows that they've got nothing to say that's productive. They're willing to throw any truth overboard in the pursuit of their cheap politics, and that is why the Morrison government can be trusted to steer this nation out of the pandemic, but those opposite cannot. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I'd like to pay my respects to those Australians around the country today uh, who are doing it tough because of the pandemic. And I'd like to acknowledge that this is a particularly difficult time for, for many Australians. Um, and I would also like to apologise, uh, if the Prime Minister won't, on behalf of this government for their policy failure in the last 12 months. Um, Australians are not only having to arm themselves against the anxiety of being in a pandemic and potentially getting the virus. Uh, they're not only having to arm themselves against uh, repeated lockdowns, loss of individual freedoms, uh, the depression that goes with the significant changes they're seeing in their life, uh, the loss of income, uh, the loss of work. Um, they're also having to arm themselves uh, against the incompetence and stupidity of this government against the U-turns, the backflips, the excuses, the policy failures and the lies. It's no wonder, with the mixed information that's been out there, the conflicting information, some of it still being peddled by coalition backbenchers, that Australians are confused and angry and anxious. And it's no wonder that they're lashing out and they're protesting. It's no wonder some are vulnerable to misinformation in this time of fake news. And it's no wonder that many won't listen to the facts and the science, considering what has happened in this place in the last decade and how often this government and coalition senators have turned their back on the science of things like climate change. Why should people listen to it on COVID when the government is actually a climate-denying government? It's no wonder that Australians are trying to get their lives back on track and we have to do everything we can to help them. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The vaccine rollout 
is a shambles, and I'm not going to repeat all of the debate that's taking place in the chamber today. I just want to really zoom in on one pending aspect of the rollout failure. Last Thursday, I got my second COVID jab. On Monday, I downloaded my COVID uh, vaccination uh, certificate from Services Australia's website. Now, within 15 minutes of doing so, I had managed to generate a forgery. So, our vac vaccination certificate has no security features whatsoever. Photoshop defeated it. Now, we're not using vaccine certificates yet, but their use is inevitable. Whether you like the vaccine, whether you don't, whether you've had it or you haven't. The moment that vaccination certificates are connected to health measures, there will be value in forgery. We have seen this in Europe. We have seen this in uh, the United States. And one of the problems is if you have got a false vaccination certificate and the health measures are relying on uh, its validity, it will endanger public health. Why would you design a vaccination certificate with no security against forg forgery? There are certainly uh, available technical solutions. It is just typical of what has been happening so far in this embarrassing failure. Basically, the PM keeps turning up to the recovery dance party late and realising that he's left his dance shoes at home. He's doing it repeatedly. He's got to change. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And the time for the discussion has expired. We now move.